We're going to spend about an hour now looking at um, funding for churches and we've got um, Emma Brooker who is our fundraising advisor and she's worked with lots of churches across the diocese for lots of different funding uh, streams. So she's going to share a little bit at the beginning. Uh, first of all, giving some ideas and tips on what churches might want to think about if you're thinking about fundraising. And we're really focusing here on social action projects, social justice things around in your community. And we're not talking today about capital grants or big roofing projects there is support for that in the diocese but that's not what today's about so just to set that out um, and then we're going to hear from Sally Bailey who's a vicar in Hounslow about some of the stuff that she has um, uh, some of the, the funding stuff that she's experienced the different small grants and large grants that they've actually been able to apply for and receive so plenty of wisdom on the ground but I'm also what, uh, mindful that we've got a room full of people who probably know quite a lot about funding themselves. So if you have other things to share, there'll be space at the end and we'll have time, hopefully, to have a bit of discussion and a chat about that. So, Emma, really delighted to have you here. Um, do you want to just tell us a little bit about who you are, your background, and then launch, launch into what it is you've got to bring to us? So I've worked for the diocese for the parish property support as a consultant for quite a few years now. So my focus has been primarily on capital projects, but I sort of think there are some basic principles that apply across the board. And that's what I'm, one of the things I'm going to talk about. Um, one of the things that's been interesting for me is that um, I'll often just get a call and be asked to advise a, a parish on something very unknown um, that I've never seen before. So my approach is to do a, a triage and basically ask lots of questions. And that's what I'm going to go through in my PowerPoint. These are the basic questions that I ask to kind of get to a point of uh, diagnosing what needs to be done and helping people do that themselves. So the PowerPoint is quite, it's quite packed, but it's something that I wanted people to be able to take away and share those questions with people in their parish and in their community and sort of, a little bit of a guide. I do understand that obviously some of you are really experienced, so forgive me if I'm talking about things that you, you know, you know about already. But it's always good to revisit these kind of core principles, I think. Okay, so the overview of what I'm going to talk about is I want to talk about laying the foundations and the key questions that I think you as an organisation need to ask. Um, I then am going to talk about what do funders want, your fundraising plan, and just to brief uh, mention of some free resources. Um, you know, I think there are lots of amazing resources out there and I'm not, and some very good resources on the uh, Church of England website. So I don't want to kind of duplicate what you can already get there. Um, and, you know, I, th I just think there's a lot that you can do um, without going and paying for professional help. Um, you know, be confident about that. Um, and part of that is using those resources. So this is this is a whistle stop tour about getting your building blocks in place. I think one of the key things is I'm not going to give you a list of funders. I will mention some, but it's actually getting those building blocks in place first. And once you've done all that preparation, then go and find your funders, then go and look at your funders and research that. Um, don't just kind of jump straight to where's the funding and how can I get it? Because that's kind of not going to get you the best results. And although it is daunting and it is challenging, I would say that if your project is soundly thought through, um, it's robust and you've tested it and it's a, it's a compelling project, then you should find funding. So it's all about the planning and the project development. So the first point is vision. And this is thinking about what is your organisation about? Um, you might know that, but you need to talk about it and agree it. And you also need to communicate to that to the wider world. Um, and it's important that the vision is shared. It's not just held in one part of your organisation. Um, it's owned and it's understood by everybody. Um, so part of this is also understanding your strengths. Um, often I'll talk to parishes and they're doing lots of amazing things, but they don't see it from an outside perspective and they're not talking about that. They're not blowing their trumpets. And I, so, you know, that's part of this kind of almost like an audit of your own organisation. Um, it's really important to have data as well um, as you set off um, so that you can define where you are now and where you want to go. And funders will want, want that data. You know, it might be just how many people come through your doors weekly. What sort of ages are they? Are they what demographic? Um, it doesn't have to be rocket science. Um, so how do you communicate this vision internally and to the wider world, different 
parishes have different ways of doing that. You might have a mission action plan um, that you review sort of annually. Um, but for somebody from the outside, one of the first things I'll look at is your website. And certainly funders will look at that, check your website. So it's absolutely essential that it's clear and consistent and that your outreach and community work is visible. And that might sound obvious, but I've um, worked with parishes who are doing incredible work and I've checked their website and it's completely invisible. Um, so obviously that's missing a trick because you're not talking about all the great stuff you're doing, but also if you're applying for funding to do outreach work and the people that you want to reach can't even see it on your website, then clearly from a funding perspective, um, that's not so strong either. So um, having your vision, knowing what's distinct about you, knowing what your strengths are, knowing what you can build on. So just to say here, I'm sure you're all aware that there are dedicated uh, Christian funders uh, who will fund Christian organisations like the Benefact Trust, the Lang Family Trusts. Um, and there are also, those, those might be sort of community-based projects, and there's also dedicated sort of um, evangelism mission funding. But the bulk of funding that um, is available is secular. And it's, it's really important that um, you read the criteria very carefully. Uh, most funders will fund church-led projects um, as long as they don't involve faith activities and they clearly benefit the wider secular community. And again, that's why you've got to kind of make what you do as outreach very clear on your website. Um, and when you, you write your project proposal, you've got to be really clear about the wider community benefit. Um, so read the funding criteria very carefully. And if you're in doubt, um, email or call to check with the funder to get clarification. So your project, what do you want to do and why? That's really important to understand that. Can you demonstrate that this project is needed? You've got to produce evidence to make your case for support. Um, and what impact will your project have? How will you measure this? So funders really want to see, you know, you've got to report back to them. They want to see the impact that their funding's having so they can put that in their report. Um, and if you don't have a measured start, then you can't sort of actually measure the impact. So that's really important to funders. Um, I think this is a key point, um, you know, you might have a fantastic idea um, and it's obviously a great thing, lots of people are going to benefit from it, but it's really important that you've consulted with the people that you want to support and this is something that funders will ask, how have you consulted? It doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be very elaborate, you know, it literally is having conversations or doing a small survey or bringing a group together. Um, and there's also, particularly with social action, how is your project going to involve and empower the people that you want to help? Um, one of the ways you might develop some of this work is running a pilot project. Um, it's really nice to get a small, smaller bit of funding to test ideas. That goes down really well with funders. It's also good for your organisation. You're not embarking on a huge project that might not work. You're testing ideas. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, it's the idea of doing projects with people, don't do projects to people. And I think often funders, they really value if you're kind of engaging with harder to reach groups, for instance, youth uh, projects. Um, on a practical level, is your organisation equipped to deliver the project? Um, are you taking off, first year off more than you can chew? Do you have the staff volunteer experience and capacity in this area? Do you have the facilities? It's really great to be ambitious, but you don't want to kind of overwhelm yourself. And you also don't want particular people in the organization to get burnt out. And there is a lot of volunteer burnout you know, around food banks at the moment. Um, so you might want to do this amazing thing, but might it be more realistic to host a project in part and work in partnership? Um, and funders absolutely love partnership. So that's something to consider. Um, yeah, and I think that thing about sharing the workloads, not burdening one particular sort of individual with the, with a the vision project, uh, that's the thing about ownership. Um, you know, it's not sustainable if one person is gonna have to do all the work. Um, also, it is better to do something smaller scale, which is sustainable and, and, and can evolve than sort of going in big guns and doing something that doesn't last very long. Um, it's really important to look at your context. Um, 
are you duplicating work that's already been done locally? Um, how does what you're proposing to do enhance what's already going on locally? Um, again, partnerships, collaborations, local networks. Um, it's really good to connect with your local authority, your ward councillors. They can be great champions. They, you know, they can support your funding applications, and there will be a local authority plan. And you know, it's really useful to look at that, understand that, so that you can refer to that again. Sometimes funders ask you to ask what's in the local plan, who have you engaged with, and this is the kind of thing that you will be able to talk about. So, uh, what do funders want? Um, they want visionary transformational projects with measurable impact. Um, and they want imaginative and innovative responses to, to a clear need. Um, they do want to see evidence that you've consulted with the people you want to help and you've involved them in finding solutions. Uh, they want really well researched and tested ideas. That's why pilot projects are good. They do want to see partnerships and collaborations that build on strengths and make their funding go further. And they want to see sustainable projects that will continue beyond the grant that they're giving you. They also want to see organisational resilience and project resilience so that you're seeking funding from a range of sources and that might include crowdfunding and even really small scale local fundraising. <clears throat> you might have a big ambitious project but the fact that you've done um, a sort of locally based crowdfunding campaign shows the buy-in and shows the support and it also is a great way of broadcasting your project you might even find you know bigger donors that way um, so I think that's really valuable uh, they want to see that you're ambitious and sometimes people think well if I apply for less I'm more likely to get it and actually I that doesn't really work you know if you're too sort of timid um, it's not going to have enough impact it's not transformative so sometimes taking something relatively small and building it up um, can get you better results and also you can get more done. Um, and also they, they do want to see change. So you might be doing an amazing project that works really well and you just need to kind of keep going with it. You want some funding to continue it. You always do need to frame things as some kind of, as some kind of change improvement. Again, it's just about how you sort of present that. You don't have to change it fundamentally, but it's important that you say how you're adding to something, what the successes that you're building on and how. Um, okay. So what do you need? Um, I put this in because I know we're talking about social action and often that is about um, bringing in project workers or supporting volunteers. But I think churches are very particular in that they have these um, community spaces which um, there aren't that many of them around and they are really really valuable and that's a lot of the value that churches bring to their communities and the flexibility of those spaces and the fact that different people can come together in them either sort of initiated by you or actually people doing their own thing so I think it's always worth including even though it, you might it's not a capital project always think about the fabric needs and, and the physical space and incorporate that in your in your fundraising plans and your fundraising strategy because otherwise you're just going to be faced with it's always easier to wrap those things up with a story about what you're doing for the wider good for people nobody's interested in just sort of putting a roof back in your church but if you include that in a project that's actually about impacting on people's lives then it's much easier to get funding for things like that um, and yeah, there are quite a few funders out there who will invest in improvements to um, church spaces. So on the basis that they use for outreach. So consider that. Um, when it comes to making a plan, again, it's who's going to lead on that and not sort of sharing out the work, sharing out the responsibility, ideally have a group. Um, you know, capacity is a really big issue. There are, um, organizations where you can find sort of quite high level volunteers with professional experience, people maybe who might have worked in fundraising and retired, people who want to develop their careers in fundraising. I can put that in the information that Alison sends out. Um, and it's just really good to talk to each other and, and sort of reflect and bounce ideas. You know, when you're doing a, an application, you definitely want to get feedback, different perspectives. So if you can form a group, form a team, um, please you know don't 
carry all the load yourself. Um, and then again, it's about this having an agreed, having a shared plan that is understood and owned by your organisation. And also that you can hand on because otherwise you have, sometimes projects take a long time and if people leave and there's no agreed plan, the, the project just kind of can evaporate. Um, it's also, uh, you know, it might, be, it might not be a problem for many people to have huge reserves, but some PCCs do have decent reserves. And, you know, I've, I've certainly advised parishes where they haven't put forward some of the, their own reserves, their own money. Um, and that's very off-putting to funders. Uh, so you have to show that you're prepared to invest, um, as well as this, this idea of raising funds as a community to demonstrate this community buy-in. Um, I mean, one thing is that you might have funds that you are go, planning to dedicate, say for a sort of kitchen refurbishment, and you want to do a community project, you can sort of maybe incorporate that refurbishment in the bigger project, in the bigger vision, and you're allocating your funding to that. And then from a funder's perspective, you are match funding and there's buy-in and it's a bigger project as well. So it's always good to sort of think around how you structure what you present. So as you will know, there are these main types of funding, capital, building, facilities upgrade works. Um, so people like uh, Violia Environment, um, Environmental Trust, uh, they, they've actually paused their programme and they're relaunching in spring actually with quite a sort of environmental slant so that will be about improving your your fabric uh, to sort of reduce energy use and all of that so that's one to look out for um, there's also revenue funding applying for staff and core costs um, somewhere like city bridge trust which i know sally um secured funding from them they tend to give quite a big ambitious project grants over several years um, and then some funders cover both so garfield western national true community fund um, as I said, I'm not going to go through a list of funders, um, but those are the sort of general categories. So when it comes to the cost of living response, um, there's obviously increased demand. So you have to make a really strong case, have your plan really well worked out. And funders will support robust, well-planned projects. And because of what's going on, funders, they review their sort of um, funding strategy annually and they will all be talking about well how are we going to respond to this um, and so you start to see funds kind of angled towards these issues that you're facing. Um, there was a as the cost of living grant um, that's one it's actually coming to a close now but that was I couldn't really find many examples that were specifically in response in terms of meeting utilities bills um, it's it's a really really tricky one and Alice and I looked at that in quite a lot of detail um, there's not that much short-term reactive funding out there. But what I would say is that if you have a good robust plan, when those things pop up, you're ready to pounce. Um, and I think, you know, that's again, going back to the plan, it's always being ready to respond because quite often funds will open for a relatively short period of time and you just don't want to be scrambling, especially if, you know, you don't have a professional fundraiser on board. You want to be ready and have things lined up. Uh, obviously, research is really important, and I think looking at the funder websites uh, for particularly, I always like to look at the case studies and also go into their accounts and look at the projects they funded, literally how much they've given to who. And if that you can't find that on the, on the funder's website, you go into the um, charity commission and they will have files their accounts and you'll get a nice list. So that's really helpful because actually what they tell you on the website doesn't always give you a clear enough picture. Um, I highly recommend looking at local funds um, because there's a smaller pool of people that can go for them, so that's good. Um, there's also, and particularly in London, there's the Neighbourhoods Community Infrastructure Levy, uh, which is held by your local authority. Now, the way in which they choose to dispense that does vary a lot from local authority to the other, and you know, some of them have more money than others, but they tend to give quite decent grants and the more ambitious, again, it's about community impact, transformation. Those are really good for social projects. They also usually can sort of bridge 
um, capital and uh, revenue funding. So do have a look at that. And that's part of that kind of knowing your context and, and connecting with people. And just obvious, but I you, sign up for funder up, updates on websites because again, suddenly a fund will open and close and the next thing you know, you've missed it. So that's um, worth doing. So finally, just a few tips. I would say do contact funders. They're usually happy to help. I mean, I'm amazed at often on the websites, the information is really out of date. So you get in touch with me, you suddenly find out that the fund's open or it's funding something that actually is really relevant to you. It's good to talk to them, build relationships. Um, it does vary. Some of the big ones, they, they don't have the capacity to talk, but others can be very hands-on and really want to make sure you're not wasting your time. Always when you're putting your funding, your project idea together, think about how you can add value. So one thing would be signing up to Eco Church because funders are increasingly saying, well, what are you doing about the environment? Even if that's not what your project's about, you know, it's like equality and diversity. It's something that they expect to see. It shows good governance. Um, and finally, I, it's, I would say that fundraising is really about storytelling. It's about framing your project with compelling narrative and, and really sort of having a robust story to tell that's exciting and that just gets funders, they want to see it happen and they feel excited about it. Um, so here are just a few, <coughs> excuse me, free resources. Obviously the Church of England website, there's lots of really good stuff there. It is mainly geared to building projects, but it's still really helpful, really relevant. This, this is an example of a free funder database that um, is pretty useful. Um, and I always, I love this toolkit from the Diocese of Hereford. Um, it's really clear, really comprehensive, and whatever the scale of your project, it's just takes you through a process that I think will get you to a point where you have a project that funders want to fund. And I've got, I will share afterwards, there is um, a, the church grants database, which the Diocese of London subscribe to, and so every parish can access, I don't know if everyone knows about that, but it's a paid subscription service, but the diocese subscribe for you, and you just need your parish code, and we will send the link round um, afterwards in an email, but also put it in the chat, but that's, a, that's again another database full of funders, who will all fund church-based projects. Some will be for specific things, some won't be. But if you're thinking, I want to fund something specific about refugees, you could go into there and have a look at that or fund something. And they'll do look at buildings and capital funds as well. So that's another, another database that you can have access to as part of being part of the Diocese of London. You just need your four-digit parish code for that. Can I come to you now, Sally? Are you OK to, to chat? So I'd love to introduce you, Sally. Um, Bailey, who's the vicar of um, Holy Trinity Hounslow, and before that you were in a parish in Edgware, is that right? Mm -hmm. So have yeah. known two Episcopal areas of our diocese. Could you just, Sally's done quite a lot of fundraising, we had a really helpful chat about their journey through and I thought it might be a useful conversation to share. Um, Sally, do you want to just tell us a little bit about your parish and your context and what needs sure. you're involved in? Sure, yeah. So um, we're a uh, city, but it's a town centre church, really, um, on the high street in Hounslow, which is a very multicultural area. Um, quite a lot of deprivation around. We've got hotels full of refugees because we're so close to um, Heathrow. And um, there's a lot of need in terms of um, food poverty, homelessness, uh, addiction. And um, we are... We, we, we've got a big building, so we've got lots of space to do stuff. Um, but our story in terms of finance is that we are quite poor and um, we have um, historically had a staff team that was funded by grants that have all now run out. So I'm literally down to one part time, three day a week administrator on our payroll. Uh, and, you know, we're a huge church with... Um, three English services on a Sunday, a Hindi service on a Saturday, plus Russian services and lots of stuff going on midweek. So we're totally reliant on volunteers. So it's not like we have a lot of time to do this. Um, but, you know, we were determined to get some funding. Sounds familiar, I'm sure, to lots of lots of people here. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what, so you, it sounds really clear that you need to do some funding. And um, I think you've done you've done lots of different types of funding since you've been. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about the smaller stuff and then the bigger stuff? That sure. Yeah. So um, the smaller stuff has um, come from the uh, London Borough of, of Hounslow, um, their household support grants. 
um, there was a, a, a feeding, a, 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 I think you'd call it a community kitchen. So there's a feeding project that we host in our car park three days a week where volunteers gather food from uh, different sources, different supermarkets, lay all the food out, and we get 50 people in the car park three times a week taking all that food and going. So I'm not sure whether that counts as a as a community pantry, Sarah, or whether it's a slightly different model, but um, that particular project um, needed some more tables, some gazebos, a fridge, a freezer, um, and some kind of consumables. And um, they actually said, look, there's the London Borough of Hounslow have got this fund called the Household Support Fund. Can you apply for some money for us? So we looked at it and it, it was around um, providing food and, and helping those who um, are in food poverty. And we realised that not only could we get all that equipment for the project outside, but also we were running a Farsi fellowship where we were doing Alpha in Farsi for a group of refugees in the local hotels. So we said, OK, our Farsi fellowship has a meal every week. So let's get the ingredients for that meal under this grant as well. And we were also able to get mileage for a volunteer who was doing a lot of runs around to all these supermarkets, picking up food and bringing it from all over West London to Hounslow. So um, uh, we were able to include getting her mileage. So we had some you know, equipment, we had some mileage costs, we have food costs uh, in that. And so the first one, and these, these grants, they give you a really short space of time to, to actually use it all up. It's like three months, you know, so we applied in, in July and I think you had to spend it by October. But then they did a second round. So we go, yeah, we'll have some of that again. Thank you. And we've got to use it by March. So we actually got 4,900 the first time and 5,000 the second time. Um, uh, so that's been good. And we've been able to use it for what you'd call mission um, without it necessarily being, you know, this is not about, um, you know, the Alpha course. It's actually about feeding the refugees. Um, so that's been helpful. So that was a small one. Um, other things we have are the Olive Branch project, which is a big project, which is a crisis drop in uh, that used to operate before COVID, but was closed down. And it used to only operate on a Saturday afternoon um, with volunteers. And then a caseworker was brought on uh, for two or three days a week. But sadly, they died during COVID. And so when I came in 18 months ago, just as COVID was coming to an end, it, there was a great big clamour that we need to open the Olive Branch project again. Um, but we wanted it to have a significant impact. Uh, and so we did go for a big project um, saying that we wanted to open two or potentially three days a week. Um, we realised that it would be helpful to have a, a consultant on board. And so um, we employed um, Carol Ward. Um, we took five days of her, maybe six days at £300 a day. But it was well worth it because we now have a fully funded project. And um, we have had a number of different sources, both including, we've, we've done all the things that Emma said you should do. We're working in collaboration. There are three churches involved in this project. Um, one of the churches is giving us 20,000 towards the um, caseworker. We'd put 5,000 in from reserves that were in the project before lockdown. And we had Whitlock Trust, which is associated with our church, give us 10,000, because they were the easiest door to push on but we also went to the Well Care Trust. Sarah, that might be interest of you because it's the Hounslow Deanery. They gave us 10,000 towards this project. And then we um, went for a number of smaller funders like B&Q Neighbourly Fund gave us 5,000 towards setup costs. And then we had some of the livery companies. The Mercer company rejected us, but the Vintner company gave us 5,000. We're still waiting to hear from the Beatrice Lang. Uh, foundation, but the City Bridge Trust, after quite a lot of um, toing and froing and um, meetings with them and um, making sure that we ticked all the boxes with our finances and everything, um, have agreed to give us 99,000 over two years. So we now have a fully funded project for two years. Um, and the cost of the fundraising consultant was built into the setup costs. So we we took a risk in a sense that you know we we we've, we valued her input, um, but I would say you still got to put quite a bit of time in yourself, because we were given the plan. We had to do the community audit ourselves, which was a simple questionnaire. What do you love about living in Hounslow? What are the challenges? 
what do you know about what the church does? And then which one of these do you see as a priority? And we just listed all the things that our project would be able to do <laughs> so that we got a lot of people in the community, both inside the church and that were standing in the queue for the food. Um, you know, and we showed that we had um, asked people inside and outside the church and the clients who were likely to be um, the, the, the guests for the Olive Branch, which is looking at mental health, looking at um, housing and looking at uh, addiction recovery. And we also reached out to local partners, you know, the London Borough of Hounslow, the local addiction recovery service, which is an NHS service. So we've kind of ticked all those boxes with partnerships. But if it wasn't for my curate and I spending hours on um, actually doing the what's it going to cost? You know, we had to come up with the fine, you know, the what's it going to cost to do this? Um, how are we going to measure this? Again, we just searched on the internet for how do you measure people's well-being? How can you show that actually you're improving well-being? And we found a, a scale of kind of well-being that was used. Um, and we also found some research by Mind on mental health, uh, the impact of COVID on mental health. So we were able to quote from that report, you know, and things like that that just support the case. Um, so look for statistics and stuff that will help support your case. So that's been hugely successful. And now, of course, my challenge is to actually recruit the staff to run the project because the curate and I cannot um, continue putting as much work into it as we do. Um, but we're very grateful for the volunteers that we have as well that help make the coffee and welcome the guests and do all of that. Brilliant. So it sounds like quite a patchwork you've had of lots of different bits. Of yeah. So you had yeah. some at the beginning that was quite small, which is, would you say that's, that enabled you to get the bigger funding or would you, would, um, would you do things differently next time? How would you, what would you learn? I think it was the fact that we had what you call a funding strategy, which was we're going out for all of these, you know, these small bids of 5,000 and we're going for the biggie. Uh, and the fact that the, um, the Deanery um, Well Care Trust was a quick one in and the Whitlock Trust was one that we knew that we could get. So the fact that we got funding from them, I think funders like to see that you've got a spread of funding. And, and, and Carol basically put all of those um, small ones in for us, the Neighbourly Fund, the Mercers, the, you know, she, once you've got, once you've got your um, case for support, it's actually very easy to then knock off, you know, well, particularly for a, someone like Emma, you know, in an afternoon, having got the case for support, having got, this is the funding strategy, this is what it costs and these are the outcomes we're looking for to just then fill in the boxes um, on, on the funders, you know, what they're asking for, or just send a letter. We did to, to um, the Lang Foundation, a covering letter with this is our case for support and our fundraising strategy. And it took from last July to January to get a response from them where they said, oh, um, can you tell us, did you start your project and how's it going? What's happening? And so we sent them an update and we're waiting to hear whether they'll give us another 5,000 towards it. Um, so, yes, it helps to have some stuff in the bag or, or you knock on the doors that are easiest first, but have them as part of a funding strategy, because it's perfectly fine to say we've got this in the bag, but we've got these five applications that are outstanding, you know, that we're going to apply for uh, so that you can show how you'll fully fund a project over time. Brilliant. Thanks, Sally. I'm sure there's lots more. I, I want to ask lots more, but I'm also aware we've got about 15 minutes left and I'm aware there's lots of other people in the room. Who Can might I just have... go for yeah. two other yeah. easy ones? Oh, yeah. Just two on, real yeah. quick wins. OK, because okay. something Emma said um, sparked with me about the um, local council. When there's a development, they have this thing. I've forgotten what it's called now. But anyway, Barrett's are building masses of flats in um, Hounslow Centre. And um, they gave us a day or more of labor. And basically we got about 40 grand's worth of renovations to the church building from Barrett because they're building all these flats and they needed to show that they were supporting the community. So they refurbished the toilets, the showers for the olive branch. They relayed a patio that was leaking. And um, so we got masses of work. So do, if, if you've got a load of building works near your church, Find out who's building them and chase down the, the site manager or whoever else and, and, and ask them, you know, what are they doing um, to give back to the community and can they do some re renovations, whatever your building needs. That was a quick win. And the other one was the Places of Worship Security Grant, which I filled in in about half an hour because literally all I needed was a picture of all the graffiti, the broken windows 
and an email from the mayor who'd got attacked as he was coming in our building and his chain stolen on the day of my licensing. Um, just some email evidence and some photos of, I'd got, I think, nine incidents um, uh, of, 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 you know, where people had, you know, we'd either had graffiti, broken windows, or um, someone had been verbally abused um, outside our church. Uh, and um, we have got funded, fully funded CCTV, inside and out of the building and access control. Now that must be worth in the order of 40 or 50,000 given the size of our building. Uh, and, and literally it was a simple form um, asking for pictures and uh, what happened and how did you feel about it? So places of worship security grant is um, was a real easy one. And I got that in Edgware as well, um, but it was only 80% funded then. So it cost the church. Um, about 8,000, but we got CCTV, alarm system, and new locks on the church. Sorry, that's it. No, no, really helpful. Um, and, and those specific things that you found that work, that's exactly what we wanted to hear from you. So thank you. That's really helpful. And in London, we're all in London parishes. Um, there's building work everywhere, isn't there? So if you see a crane, follow the crane to the building site. Is that, that's your top tip. Um, and also, I think it's interesting that you've got funding from people like B&Q. You, you wouldn't necessarily know you'd get funding from. We often think, don't we, about large trusts. Um, sort of, you know, City London trusts, but actually there's lots of different people who might give you little bits. Um, but it sounds like having the fundraising advisor was really key for you as well. Yeah, that was a really good investment, um, given how much we've got now um, as a result of that. And I think it gave us confidence as well that, um, you know, we were able to work with her to um, really um, map out the case for support uh, as to what the project was, what it was going to achieve. And she again encouraged us to go big with the ask. Um, you know, so initially with City Bridge Trust, we'd only asked for um, about 50,000. And in fact, we went large and got. 99,000. Amazing. Um, so I think one of the things that I was going to ask you about, Sally, was getting started. You talked, you mentioned quite a lot of local, like, well care trust. I think you've mentioned in Whitlock Trust. How do people find out about them? I mean, where did you hear about it? Because part of it is just knowing, isn't it? Just literally facts. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the World Care Trust was um, a deanery thing. So I think ask ask your deanery synod, um, you know, your, your chapter, if you're a clergy person, um, you know, we, we get a newsletter every week with that on. But I've also um, previously um, done some fundraising through Groundwork, and they tend to um, kind of, I still get emails from them with, oh, there's a fund opened here or a fund opened there. So just you know, looking out for those and signing up for newsletters, you just have to scan quickly and, you know, delete most of them. But, you know, sometimes something will pop up and you think, oh, that's interesting. Or actually read all the things from commu from Compassionate Communities newsletter, you know, because they tell us about, you know, you guys tell us about stuff as well. And, um, you know, so I think just keeping your eyes open and, um, and asking um, in the locality. Um, yeah. So chatting at chapter, chatting with other people, listening to local authorities. Emma, anything you want to add about that in terms of where people can find out from the very beginning where, you know, where they might be able to apply? Yeah, I mean, we do actually have a directory that I would like to send out to people that was com uh, commissioned by the LDF that does have some really localised funding. Um, so that's something that we can send around. Yeah, I, I think it is just keeping your eyes peeled, signing up for updates. Um, I don't think there's anything we can do than that um, there's loads and loads of databases you just you can't comb through them the same things start coming up again and again yeah. you know and there's a limit to what's relevant yeah I think looking out Sally? for um the banks as you well um if you've if you're on a high street or you're near a, a bank branch uh sometimes they have um local charities that they can put forward um to their set head office um for potential grants or they may even say well we've got um you know, staff who are available to help out with the project um, so that they all get, I think they get a day off a year or something to do charity work. So often where you've got a big corporate um, near your church, um, they do have corporate social responsibility that they like to put in their annual report and they might be happy to give you either some time or some money or something. Um, I, Mike's put a question. Mm -hmm. Do we have a list of successful grant applications received in the diocese? Because most of these grants are actually uh, secured by PCCs, we, do, we don't have that information held centrally. Um, sometimes the diocese will apply for funds, but 
Um, I mean, that's when it's really good to go and look at websites, look at case studies, look at other churches' websites, and sometimes they'll list the funders, and you start to build up a picture of who the relevant people are. Benefact is a good one for, for looking at that. Definitely. I mean, and that's what church, I mean, partly church grants database is partly for that, in that they're all all the organisations on the church grants database are all ones that have funded churches in the past. So we know they will fund churches. They may fund different projects. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are some ones that you'll keep, like you say, you'll keep hearing about again and again. Yeah, I'm hopeful about the Lang Foundation as well, because I know that they gave money for a youth project in um, Collingdale when I was up in the Edgware area of London. Um, they, they gave money to, um, to help support a youth project and provide um, funding for music lessons and for um, creative art stuff. Um, so yeah, they're, they're good with churches. Yeah, so I just had a quick question. So I, I mean, my only experience of actually writing the nitty gritty of grants applications was in the kind of aid sector, but I, I expect it's, you know, similar logic. Are, are there any places where people can look to actually write things like indicators and how they're gonna monitor it? Because Sally talked there, I think about wellbeing indicators. Are there any good, I don't know in any of those toolkits or are there any good sources of just looking at other examples where people can get ideas for writing some of those indicators? Yeah, there's the local government um, indices of multiple deprivation. That's always quite useful because you can look at the map and actually your parish might be in a more affluent area, but because we're in London, everything's cheap by jowl. You might be serving communities that are in a much in a, in a very different sort of uh, category. So that's always worth looking at. I mean, it was interesting to hear, hear Sally say that about um, the mind research. I think you know it's legitimate to sort of draw on sort of work like that and see it, keep an eye on what's what's coming out. Um, I mean, there are templates for consultation, um, community com consultation, and there are templates for community audits. It's, I don't know if that's the sort of thing that you're wondering about as well, but those are available through, are, are they on the LDF website? Yeah. So, yeah, on the LDF website, there is a fundraising um, page that helps go through all the different pro steps of processes, and there's a community audit. Fun, um, there's, there's some videos there around resources and, and watching those, but there's some around community auditing. And there's some then around putting together this thing that case for support, which I think Sally and Emma have both talked about, which seems quite a key document to have. But then I think the thing about how do you measure what you're doing? There's some stuff around that. That's really key. So, um, Sally, do you want to speak a little bit about what you've what you've done around how you measure? Because you talked a little bit about it, but I think yeah, it's a key. Yeah, point. I mean, with the with the um, household support grant, it was very simple that we just have to keep a note of how many people are in the queue for food and how many of them have children um, and how many meals we serve. So um, that's a pure numeric measure um, on that one. And the fact that we've actually bought the equipment we said we did and we, you know, we give them a, a, a spreadsheet of, of how we spent the money. Um, with the um, crisis drop in, um, it was it, it was slightly more difficult. Um, but so we were looking around for measures um, of, of well-being and mental well-being. And um, I can't even remember what the what the scale's called now, but there was a scale that people when when they you know when a, a psychologist would be assessing somebody, they'd put them on a scale. Um, and we were looking just to move them one point on that scale. So um, but then you do have to, and we are using church suite for any large churches that are using church suite to actually measure key dates. So, uh, and also we're measuring um, the services that we deliver. So how many breakfasts do we serve? How many people have showers? Um, you know, we had a highlight last week because one guy had a shower. He's been coming for three months and refused to shower. And finally he had a shower. That was for us, that was a big moment of trust that this guy actually felt comfortable that he would take a shower in our building, um, you know, and community engagement, referrals. So we're basically capturing the data on everything particularly referrals, because as a drop in, we're not, apart from giving the practical help, actually what we're doing is referring to for prof professionals. So we just need to um, make sure that we collect um, the key dates on when they've been referred. And when we finally get a caseworker, they'll be able to follow through on, did those people actually attend the referral and, you know, how successful and then, you know, how many people have we actually got into secure housing? And um, so we will be, you know, continuing to collect that data. So we actually um, priced in a day a week of an administrator. Um, so everything you need to do all this stuff, just price it in. 
you know, so um, our, our, well, that's the only way we can afford a three day a week administrator because one of those days is actually charged to the project. <laughs> so um, yeah, just, just price it all in. Uh, so don't be um, uh, scared to actually ask for the money to do the impact measuring and the, all the data that you're gonna need to collect and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you can even put money in for writing the reports at the end of it as well. <laughs> you just, yeah, cost it all in. Um, I wanted to say about having qualitative data and the storytelling. Um, you know, having little anonymous interviews. Those that because sometimes it is hard to measure. How do, how do you measure these qualitative impacts? Um, and I think again, it's like small case studies, interviews, commentary. It's really really powerful, and it's lovely to use that in funding applications. That goes down really well. Uh, wanted to say thank you so much to our uh, speakers. Thank you, Sally. Thank you for taking time out and having your lunch. I know you've got a meeting to go to. And thank you, Emma, as well, for sharing all your wisdom. Really grateful. Um, and um, we're really, it's just good to hear some stories and good to hear some, some practical wisdom. But thanks again, Sally and Emma. Really appreciate it.